Section 20 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. June 1645. The next morning, finding myself extremely weary and beaten with my journey, I went to one of their bagnos where you are treated after the eastern manner, washing with hot and cold water, with oils, and being rubbed with a kind of strigil of seal skin put on the operator's hand like a glove. This bath did so open my pores that it cost me one of the greatest colds I ever had in my life, for want of necessary caution in keeping myself warm for some time after, for coming out I immediately began to visit the famous places of the city, and travellers who come into Italy do nothing but run up and down to see sights, and this city well deserved our admiration, being the most wonderfully placed of any in the world, built on so many hundred islands, in the very sea, and at good distance from the continent. It has no fresh water except what is reserved in cistern from rain, and such as is daily brought from terra firma in boats, yet there was no want of it, and all sorts of excellent provisions were very cheap. It is said that when the Huns overran Italy, some mean fishermen and others left the mainland and fled for shelter to these despicable and muddy islands, which in process of time, by industry, are grown to the greatness of one of the most considerable states, considered as a republic, and having now subsisted longer than any of the four ancient monarchies, flourishing in great state, wealth and glory, by the conquest of great territories in Italy, Dacia, Greece, Candia, Rhodes and Sclavonia, and at present challenging the empire of all the Adriatic Sea, which they yearly espouse by casting a gold ring into it with great pomp and ceremony on Ascension Day. The desire of seeing this was one of the reasons that hastened us from Rome. The Doge, having heard Mass in his robes of state, which were very particular after the Eastern fashion, together with the Senate in their gowns, embarked in their gloriously painted, carved and gilded Bucentora, environed and followed by innumerable galleys, gondolas and boats, filled with spectators, some dressed in masquerade, trumpets, music and cannons. Having rowed about a league into the gulf, the Duke at the prow casts a gold ring and cup into the sea, at which a loud acclamation is echoed from the great guns of the arsenal and at the Lido. We then returned. Two days after, taking a gondola, which is their water-coach, for land ones there are many old men in this city who never saw one, or rarely a horse, we rode up and down the channels which answer to our streets. These vessels are built very long and narrow, having necks and tails of steel, somewhat spreading at the beak like a fish's tail, and kept so exceedingly polished as to give a great lustre. Some are adorned with carving, others lined with velvet, commonly black, with curtains and tassels, and the seats like couches to lie stretched on, while he who rows stands upright on the very edge of the boat, and with one oar bending forward, as if he would fall into the sea, rows and turns with incredible dexterity, thus passing from channel to channel, landing his fare or patron at what house he pleases. The beaks of these vessels are not unlike the ancient Roman rostrums. The first public building I went to see was the Rialto, a bridge of one arch over the Grand Canal, so large as to admit a galley to row under it, built of good marble, and having on it, besides many pretty shops, three ample and stately passages for people without any inconvenience, the two outmost nobly ballasted with the same stone, a piece of architecture much to be admired. It was evening, and the canal where the noblesse go to take the air, as in our Hyde Park, was full of ladies and gentlemen. There are many times dangerous stops, by reason of the multitude of gondolas, ready to sink one another, and indeed they affect to lean them on one side, that one who is not accustomed to it would be afraid of oversetting. Here they were singing, playing on harpsichords and other music, 
and serenading their mistresses, in another place racing and other pastimes on the water, it being now exceeding hot. Next day I went to their exchange, a place like ours, frequented by merchants, but nothing so magnificent. From thence my guide led me to the Fondigo di Todecci, which is their magazine, and here many of the merchants, especially Germans, have their lodging and diet, as in a college. The outside of this stately fabric is painted by Giordone da Castelfranco and Titian himself. Hence I pass through the Mercura, one of the most delicious streets in the world for the sweetness of it, and is all the way on both sides, tapestried, as it were, with cloth of gold, rich damasks and other silks, which the shops expose and hang before their houses from the first floor, and with that variety that for near half the year spent chiefly in this city, I hardly remember to have seen the same piece twice exposed. To this add the perfumes, apothecaries' shops, and the innumerable cages of nightingales which they keep, that entertain you with their melody from shop to shop, so that shutting your eyes you would imagine yourself in the country, when indeed you are in the middle of the sea. It is almost as silent as the middle of a field, there being neither rattling of coaches nor trampling of horses. This street, paved with brick and exceedingly clean, brought us through an arch into the famous piazza of St. Mark. Over this porch stands that admirable clock celebrated next to that of Strasbourg for its many movements, among which about twelve and six, which are their hours of Ave Maria, when all the town are on their knees, come forth the three kings, led by a star, and passing by the image of Christ in his mother's arms, to their reverence, and enter into the clock by another door. At the top of this turret another automaton strikes the quarters. An honest merchant told me that one day walking in the piazza he saw the fellow who kept the clock struck with this hammer so forcibly as he was stooping his head near the bell to mend something amiss at the instant of striking that being stunned he reeled over the battlements and broke his neck. The buildings in this piazza are all arched on pillars, paved within with black and white polished marble, even to the shops, the rest of the fabric as stately as any in Europe, being not only marble, but the architecture is of the famous Sansovini, who lies buried in San Giacomo at the end of the piazza. The battlements of this noble range of buildings are railed with stone and thick set with excellent statues, which add a great ornament. One of the sides is yet much more Roman-like than the other, which regards the sea and where the church is placed. The other range is plainly Gothic, and so we entered into St Mark's Church, before which stand two brass pedestals, exquisitely cast and figured, which bear as many tall masts painted red, on which, upon great festivals, they hang flags and streamers. The church is also Gothic, yet for the preciousness of the materials, being of several rich marbles, abundance of porphyry, serpentine, etc., far exceeding any in Rome, St. Peter's hardly excepted, I much admired the splendid history of our blessed Saviour, composed all of mosaic over the facciata, below which and over the four chief gates are cast four horses in copper as big as the life, the same that formerly were transported from Rome by Constantine to Byzantium, and thence by the Venetians hither. They are supported by eight porphyry columns of very great size and value. Being come into the church, you see nothing and tread on nothing but what is precious. The floor is all inlaid with agates, lazulis, chalcedons, jaspers, porphyries and other rich marbles, admirable also for the work. The walls sumptuously encrusted and presenting to the imagination the shapes of men, birds, house, flowers and a thousand varieties. The roof is of most excellent mosaic. But what most persons admire is the new work on the emblematic tree at the other passage out of the church. In the midst of this rich volto rise five cupolas, 
the middle very large and sustained by thirty-six marble columns, eight of which are of precious marbles. Under these cupolas is the high altar, on which is a reliquary of several sorts of jewels engraven with figures, after the Greek manner, and set together with plates of pure gold. The altar is covered with a canopy of ophite, on which is sculptured the story of the Bible, and so on the pillars, which are of Perean marble, that support it. Behind these are four other columns of transparent and true oriental alabaster, brought hither out of the mines of Solomon's temple, as they report. There are many chapels and notable monuments of illustrious persons, dukes, cardinals, etc., as Zeno, J. Soranzi, and others. There is likewise a vast baptistry of copper. Among other venerable relics is a stone on which they say our blessed Lord stood preaching to those of Tyre and Sidon, and near the door is an image of Christ, much adorned, esteeming it very sacred, for that a rude fellow striking it, they say, there gushed out a torrent of blood. In one of the corners lies the body of San Isidore, brought hither five hundred years since from the island of Chios. A little farther they show the picture of St. Dominic and Francis, affirmed to have been made by the abbot Joachim many years before any of them were born. Going out of the church, they showed us the stone where Alexander the Third trod on the neck of the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, pronouncing that verse of the psalm Super Basiliscum, etc. The doors of the church are of massy copper. There are near five hundred pillars in this building, most of them porphyry and serpentine, and brought chiefly from Athens and other parts of Greece, formerly in their power. At the corner of the church are inserted into the main wall four figures as big as life, cut in porphyry, which they say are the images of four brothers who poisoned one another, by which means were seated to the Republic that vast treasury of relics now belonging to the church. At the other entrance that looks toward the sea stands in a small chapel that statue of Our Lady, made, as they affirm, of the same stone or rock out of which Moses brought water to the murmuring Israelites at Horeb or Meribah. After all that is said, this church is, in my opinion, much too dark and dismal, and of heavy work. The fabric, as is much of Venice, both for buildings and other fashions and circumstances, after the Greeks, their next neighbours. The next day, by favour of the French ambassador, I had admittance with him to view the reliquary, called here Tesoro di San Marco, which very few, even of travellers, are admitted to see. It is a large chamber full of presses. There are twelve breastplates, or pieces of pure golden armour, studded with precious stones, and as many crowns dedicated to St. Mark by so many noble Venetians, who had recovered their wives taken at sea by the Saracens, many curious vases of agates, the cap or coronet of the Dukes of Venice, one of which had a ruby set on it, esteemed worth two hundred thousand crowns, two unicorn's horns, numerous vases and dishes of agate, set thick with precious stones and vast pearls, diverse heads of saints, enchased in gold, a small ampulla or glass with our Saviour's blood, a great morsel of the real cross, one of the nails, a thorn, a fragment of the column to which our Lord was bound when scourged, the standard or ensign of Constantine, a piece of St. Luke's arm, a rib of St. Stephen, a finger of Mary Magdalen, numerous other things which I could not remember. But a priest, first vesting himself in his sacerdotals with a stole about his neck, showed us the Gospel of St. Mark, a tutelar patron, written by his own hand, and whose body they show buried in the church, brought hither from Alexandria many years ago. The religious daily servi have fine paintings of Paolo Veronese, especially the Magdalene. A French gentleman and myself went to the courts of justice, the senate house and ducal palace. 
The first court near this church is almost wholly built of several coloured sorts of marble, like checker work on the outside. This is sustained by vast pillars, not very shapely, but observable for their capitals, and that out of thirty-three no two are alike. Under this fabric is the cloister, where merchants meet morning and evening, as also the grave senators and gentlemen, to confer of state affairs, in their gowns and caps, like so many philosophers. It is a very noble and solemn spectacle. In another quadrangle stood two square columns of white marble, carved, which they said had been erected to hang one of their dukes on, who designed to make himself sovereign. Going through a stately arch, there were standing in niches diverse statues of great value, among which is the so celebrated Eve, esteemed worth its weight in gold. It is just opposite to the stairs, where are two colossuses of Mars and Neptune by San Savino, we went up into a corridor built with several tribunals and courts of justice, and by a well-contrived staircase were landed in the Senate Hall, which appears to be one of the most noble and spacious rooms in Europe, being seventy-six paces long and thirty-two in breadth. At the upper end are the tribunals of the Doge, Council of Ten and Assistants. In the body of the hall are lower ranks of seats, capable of containing 1,500 senators, for they consist of no fewer on grand debates. Over the Duke's throne are the paintings of the final judgment by Tintoretto, esteemed among the best pieces in Europe. On the roof are the famous acts of the Republic, painted by several excellent masters, especially Bassano. Next to them are the effigies of the several Dukes, with their elegies. Then we turned into a great court, painted with the Battle of Lepanto, an excellent piece. Afterward, into the chamber of the Council of Ten, painted by the most celebrated masters. From hence, by the special favour of an illustrissimo, we were carried to see the private armoury of the palace, and so to the same court we first entered, nobly built of polished white marble, part of which is the Duke's court pro tempore. There are two wells adorned with excellent work in copper. This led us to the seaside, where stand those columns of orphite stone in the entire piece of a great height, one bearing St. Mark's lion, the other St. Theodorus. These pillars were brought from Greece and set up by Nicholas Baratarius, the architect. Between them, public executions are performed. Having fed our eyes with the noble prospect of the island of St. George, the galleys, gondolas and other vessels passing to and fro, we walked under the cloister on the other side of this goodly piazza, being a most magnificent building, the design of San Savino. Here we went into the secca, or mint. At the entrance stand two prodigious giants, or Hercules, of white marble, we saw them melt, beat and coin silver, gold and copper. We then went up into the procuratory and a library of excellent manuscripts and books belonging to it and the public. After this we climbed up the tower of St Mark, which we might have done on horseback, as it is said one of the French kings did, there being no stairs or steps, but returned to the take up an entire square on the arches forty feet, broad enough for a coach. This steeple stands by itself without any church near it and is rather a watch-tower in the corner of the great piazza, 230 feet in height, the foundation exceeding deep. On the top is an angel that turns with the wind and from hence is a prospect down the Adriatic as far as Istria and the Dalmatian side with the surprising sight of this miraculous city lying in the bosom of the sea in the shape of a lute the numberless islands tacked together by no fewer than 450 bridges. At the foot of this tower is a public tribunal of excellent work in white marble polished, adorned with several brass statues and figures of stone and mezzo relievo, the performance of some rare artist. It was now Ascension Week, and the great mart or fair of the whole year was kept, everybody at liberty and jolly, the noblemen stalking with their ladies on chopines, 
These are high-heeled shoes, particularly affected by these proud dames, or, as some say, invented to keep them at home, it being very difficult to walk with them. Whence one being asked how he liked the Venetian dames replied they were mezzo carne, mezzo legno, half flesh, half wood, and he would have none of them. The truth is their garb is very odd, as seeming always in masquerade, their other habits also totally different from all nations. They wear very long crisp hair of several streaks and colours, which they make so by a wash, dishevelling it on the brims of a broad hat that has no crown but a hole to put out their heads by. They dry them in the sun, as one may see them at their windows. In their tire they set silk flowers and sparkling stones, their petticoats coming from their very armpits, so that they are near three-quarters and a half apron. Their sleeves are made exceedingly wide, under which their shift sleeves, as wide and commonly tucked up to the shoulder, showing their naked arms, through full sleeves of Tiffany, girt with a bracelet or two, with knots of point richly tagged about their shoulders and other places of their body, which they usually cover with a kind of yellow veil of lawn, very transparent. Thus attired, they set their hands on the heads of two matron-like servants or old women to support them, who are mumbling their beads. It is ridiculous to see how these ladies crawl in and out of their gondolas by reason of their chopinets, and what dwarfs they appear when taken down from their wooden scaffolds. Of these I saw near thirty together, stalking half as high again as the rest of the world. For courtesans or the citizens may not wear chopinets, but cover their bodies and faces with a veil of a certain glittering taffeta or lustre, out of which they now and then dart a glance of their eye, the whole face being otherwise entirely hid with it. Nor may the common misses take this habit, but go abroad bare-faced. To the corner of these virgin veils hang broad but flat tassels of curious point de Venise, the married women go in black veils. The nobility wear the same colour, but a fine cloth lined with taffeta in summer, with fur of the bellies of squirrels in the winter, which all put on at a certain day, girt with a girdle embossed with silver, the vest not much different from what our bachelors of arts wear in Oxford, and a hood of cloth, made like a sack cast over the left shoulder, and a round cloth black cap fringed with wool, which is not so comely. They also wear their collar open, to show the diamond button of the stock of their shirt. I have never seen pearls for colour and bigness comparable to what the ladies wear, most of the noble families being very rich in jewels, especially pearls, which are always left to the son or brother who is destined to marry, which the eldest seldom do. The doge's vest is of crimson velvet, the procurators, etc., of damask, very stately. Nor was I less surprised with the strange variety of the several nations seen every day in the streets and piazzas, Jews, Turks, Armenians, Persians, Moors, Greeks, Sclavonians, some with their targets and bucklers, and all in their native fashions, negotiating in this famous emporium, which is always crowded with strangers. This night, having with my Lord Bruce taken our places before we went to the opera, where comedies and other plays are represented in restative music by the most excellent musicians, vocal and instrumental, with variety of scenes painted and contrived with no less art of perspective, and machines for flying in the air and other wonderful notions, Taken together, it is one of the most magnificent and expensive diversions the wit of man can invent. The history was Hercules in Lydia. The scenes changed thirteen times. The famous voices, Anna Rentia, a Roman, and reputed the best treble of women. But there was a eunuch who, in my opinion, surpassed her. Also a Genoese that sang an incomparable bass. This held us by the eyes and ears till two in the morning, when we went to the Ketto de San Felice to see the noblemen and their ladies at Basset, a game at cards which is much used. But they play not in public, and all that have inclination to it are in masquerade, without speaking one word, 
and so they come in, play, lose or gain, and go away as they please. This time of licence is only in Carnival, and this Ascension Week. Neither are there theatres open for that other magnificence or for ordinary comedians, save on these solemnities, they being a frugal and wise people, and exact observers of all sumptuary laws. There being at this time a ship bound for the Holy Land, I had resolved to embark, intending to see Jerusalem and other parts of Syria, Egypt and Turkey. But after I had provided all necessaries laid in snow to cool our drink, bought some sheep, poultry, biscuit, spirits and little cabinet of drugs in case of sickness, our vessel, whereof Captain Powell was master, happened to be pressed for the service of the state to carry provisions to Cundia, now newly attacked by the Turks, which altogether frustrated my desire to my great mortification. Padua On the of June we went to Padua to the fair of their St. Anthony in company of diverse passengers. The first terra firma we landed at was Fusina, being only an inn where we changed our barge and were then drawn up by horses through the river Brenta, a straight channel as even as a line for twenty miles, the country on both sides deliciously adorned with country villas and gentlemen's retirements, gardens planted with oranges, figs and other fruit belonging to the Venetians. At one of these villas we went ashore to see a pretty contrived palace. Observable in this passage was buying their water of those who farm the sluices for this artificial river is in some places so shallow that reserves of water are kept with sluices which they open and shut with the most ingenious invention or engine governed even by a child. Thus they keep up the water or let it go till the next channel be either filled by the stop or abated to the level of the other for which every boat pays a certain duty. Thus we stayed near half an hour and more at three several places so it was evening before we got to Padua. This is a very ancient city, if the tradition of antennas, being the founder, be not a fiction. But thus speaks the inscription over a stately gate, Hanc antoquissimam orbem literarum omnium asylum, cuius agrum fertilitatis lumen natura resi voluit, anteno condidit, Anno ante Christum natum M C X V one 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 Senatus autem Venatus his belli propugnaculis or navit. The town stands on the river Pardus, whence its name, and is generally built like Bologna on arches and on brick, so that one may walk all round it dry and in the shade which is very convenient in these hot countries, and I think was I was never sensible of so burning a heat as I was this season, especially the next day, which was that of the fair, filled with noble Venetians, by reason of a great and solemn procession to their famous cathedral. Passing by San Lorenzo, I met with this subscription, In Cletus Antenno Patrium Vox Nisa Quietum Transtulit Hook Hanatum Dardanidum qui fuga expulit uganeos patavinam candidit orbem quem tegit hic humili marmore cesar domus. Under the tomb was a cobbler at his work. Being now come to St. Anthony's, the street most of the way straight, well built, and outside excellently painted in fresco, we surveyed the spacious piazza in which is erected a noble statue of copper of a man on horseback in memory of one Catamalata, a renowned captain. The church alla Greca consists of five handsome cupolas leaded. At the left hand within is the tomb of St. Anthony and his altar, about which a mezzo relievo of the miracles ascribed to him is exquisitely wrought in white marble by the three famous sculptors Tullius Lombardus, Jacobo Sansovinus, and Hieronymus Compagno. A little higher is the choir, walled parapet fashion, with sundry coloured stone, half relievo, the work of Andrea Recchi. 
the altar within is of the same metal which, with the candlestick and bases, is in my opinion as magnificent as any in Italy. The wainscot of the choir is rarely inlaid and carved. Here are the sepulchres of many famous persons, as of Rodolphus Fulgosi, etc., and among the rest, one for an exploit at sea, has a galley exquisitely carved thereon. The procession bore the banners with all the treasure of the cloister, which was a very fine sight. Hence, walking over the Prato delle Valle, I went to see the convent of San Giustina, than which I never beheld one more magnificent. The church is an excellent piece of architecture of Andrea Palladio, richly paved with a stately cupola that covers the high altar enshrining the ashes of that saint. It is of Pietra Comessa, consisting of flowers very naturally done. The choir is inlaid with several sorts of wood representing the holy history, finished with exceeding industry. At the far end is that rare painting of San Giustina's martyrdom by Paolo Veronese, and a stone on which they told us diverse primitive Christians had been decapitated. In another place, to which leads a small cloister well painted, is a dry well covered with a brasswork grate, wherein are the bones of diverse martyrs. They show also the bones of St. Luke in an old alabaster coffin, three of the holy innocents, and the bodies of St. Maximus and the Prostocimus. The dormitory above is exceedingly commodious and stately, but what most pleased me was the old cloister so well painted with the legendary saints, mingled with many ancient inscriptions and pieces of urns dug up, it seems, at the foundation of the church. Thus, having spent the day in rambles, I returned the next day to Venice. End of section 20